Good morning. Welcome back. I'm Ellen Letterman, Sloan Management Class of 1991. I'm really pleased to be introducing this morning's panel session, Women on Boards. Many think of a board position as the ultimate glass ceiling for women in business and also the pinnacle career goal. As we will hear this morning, there are a lot of paths to get a board position. As an executive, we've heard that from Judy. Uh, as an investor, uh, many of us have started at nonprofit boards. But there are also a lot of obstacles, mainly that old boy network. <laughs> In parts of Europe, quotas or targets have been set to improve gender diversity. Studies have shown that diversity is not only desirable, but makes for better business, and role models at the top inspire women throughout any organization. Yet, the global average on gender diversity is that only 14.7% of boards include women. Europe has a higher average with 24.4%, uh, but I unfortunately live in Switzerland, which is quite male dominated, and it's still only at 13.4%. And the US is currently ranked 14th in the world in gender diversity on boards. I am currently on my path to being a non-executive director. I've been a CFO of a private equity asset manager. I have years working internationally in investment banking and impact investing, and have served on several nonprofit boards. Um, and as one of my classmates can attest a few minutes beforehand, I've gotten a uh, word that I am officially nominated for my first um, for-profit board. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so how did, um, I was fortunate enough to complete a one-year board apprenticeship. Um, I've also obtained a professional qualification in investment fund governance. Uh, board apprentice is a UK scheme that's spreading like wildfire to other countries that give women like me a foot in the door to observe the workings and dynamics of boards. Uh, the Certified Investment Fund Director program is aimed at professionalizing governance and financial institutions, and the US version of the course is here in New York City this week. Um, materials on both programs are available if anyone's interested, and I'd be happy to speak about either. Uh, yet, right now, we have an excellent group of panelists for this session, and they span the gamut of working on public sector boards, private corporation boards, having come as investors, insiders, independent directors. Some are seasoned like Judy, some are new, newer to the, the ranks of governance. This panel will be moderated by Judy Luent, who we all just had the immense pleasure of hearing speak about her life and leadership lessons. Um, as you know and heard, Judy serves on a number of boards including two at MIT, the MIT Corporation and the MIT Sloan America's Executive Board. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Judy Luent back on stage. Hi. Okay, so um, the thinking, the think, that's, okay. <laughs> the thinking uh, is for our panel that uh, We'll have a few opening comments from and introductory uh, introductions from my fellow panelists, and I may fill in a few words afterwards, fill in a few gaps or whatever other observations, um, and we'll have a little interaction, and most importantly, throw the floor open to questions as as we've done in the past. So, please. sure. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Judy. Um, my name is Suzanne Fry. Um, I'm a class of 2006 Sloan Fellows and uh, currently a uh, director at Google. Uh, my day job involves governance and compliance and a bunch of legal and security matters, protecting sort of the corpus of data that's in Gmail, Google Docs, Drive, those types of pro uh, products. And I currently serve on the board, a private board, The Motley Fool. Um, so some of you all may know that name. It tends to stick with people. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I joined that board two years ago. And um, it's a private board, uh, but a great, great group of individuals who serve on that board alongside me. I'm very honored. Um, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods. Um, 
uh, Putnam Coe's, a former CEO of Paulson and Company, um, a former officer at Goldman. So private boards can be a great, great opportunity. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Rohini Chakravarti, and I'm um, MBA class of 99. And I've been an investor board member on, on many boards. So as a partner at um, NEA, New Enterprise Associates, I've been on 13 boards, um, all private company boards. And then I've been on the board of a nonprofit, which is the Ragazzi Boys Chorus, which is where my son sings. And um, I'm on the board of the IIT Madras Foundation. That's my undergrad school. It's an academic foundation board. Um, my, my path to boards, and I thought this was interesting as we were talking about this panel, um, and I was part of the committee organizing this as well. So um, my path to boards was very different from some of the execs that you're going to hear about. And uh, there was a question already on, uh, on how do you get on these boards and so on. So I'm ha I was happy to give my voice to this uh, discussion. My, my first break actually came right out of Sloan. One of my classmates was um, a technical assistant to the CEO of Intel. And she, you know, she said, well, maybe you'll actually be go a good investor. She, she knew me, and she knew me as somebody who was analytical, who had been an engineer before that. And so I actually got to Intel uh, Capital right out of Sloan. And I stayed there for seven years, was an investor. I didn't actually get on any boards in those seven years. I was a board observer on many, many uh, companies um, during my uh, seven plus years at Intel. And then when I went to a venture firm, um, I started getting on board. So initially I got on boards as a tandem board member with some senior partners. So this was sort of a way to train people to be on boards. And, and eventually kind of being the investor representative on many boards. So happy to talk about any of those experiences and really glad to be here uh, at a Sloan gathering. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Sandy Helton, and it's just wonderful to be here with this group of accomplished women and uh, to get to know some of you I don't know and see some old friends. And I, I do have a special thank you for creating an opportunity to see my friend Judy Lewand again. <laughs> but uh, as she was talking, uh, I felt like my life was sort of flashing in front of my eyes, and I was thinking about a lot of things, both career-wise and board-wise. But my first uh, public company board uh, was in 1995, and I've served on seven public company boards. Uh, in 1995, I was senior vice president and treasurer of Corning, and really hadn't been thinking too much about going on a board, uh, except I did notice that the senior guys at Corning were serving on one or two boards, and it seemed to be a valued activity, both for personal development and also to bring back ideas to the company. But I got this call out of the blue from a search firm, and they suggested I might be interested in joining the board of Luke and Steel. And I had a conversation with the CEO and a couple of people from the Nominating Governance Committee. And the next thing I knew, I was on that board. And I stayed on that board for three years until we sold Lucan's to Bethlehem Steel. Uh, I did leave Corning, and I went to another company briefly and ended up uh, at Telephone and Data Systems in Chicago. And that was a public company, but it was a controlled company with the founding family having um, super voting shares and control over the board. And it was uh, customary for the CFO to be on the board. So I served not only on the board of TDS as an insider, but they had two subsidiaries that had public carve-outs, and I was also on those boards. Uh, and those were US Cellular and Aerial Corporation. Uh, when I took the job at TDS, uh, I let them know that I thought that serving on an external public board was a very important thing for me and also for the company, and that was a condition of my joining the company. Uh, it was definitely not in the tradition of TDS, but um, they were very accommodating in that. Uh, and before long, I was approached by a search firm for the board of Principal Financial Group, uh, where I still serve. Uh, that was in 2001. And really, the connection there was the search people who had placed me at TDS knew me uh, from that experience, and they uh, thought that I would be a good candidate for a public company board. Uh, in 2003, I was asked to join the board of Covance, 
uh, which is a contract research organization for the pharmaceutical and biotech uh, industry. And even though Covance had actually been a spinoff of Corning, and I'd been involved in the creation of Covance, uh, I ended up being asked to join that board because the chairman of the Nominating and Governance Committee uh, was a friend with whom I served on a nonprofit board in Chicago. Uh, and then uh, my last uh, public company board was Lexmark International. And uh, that was a combination of a search firm and uh, really being promoted by someone with whom I had served on another board uh, as a candidate for Lexmark. And I'm no longer on either Lexmark or Covance because we sold those companies. And I'm actually in the market again <laughs> for other board opportunities and uh, finding it a very interesting process, a little different for me now because uh, uh, on the plus side, I have the experience. On the negative side, uh, people look at me and say, well, you haven't uh, been a full-time executive for 10 years. and uh, Maybe you don't have 10 years to retirement, so that's another dynamic. Uh, but at any rate, uh, as I thought about this subject, um, everyone wants to know how do you get on a board, but I think an equally important issue is what board do you want to be on? And I will just briefly uh, say before we go to general comments, um, that is really critical for, for, I think, most everybody to think about what do you want from a board? What can you give to a board? And what are the conditions that you think are important for a successful board experience? Uh, certainly thinking about the company and the industry and uh, you know, being sure that that's something that's going to excite you because it is a lot of work. I estimate that in good times, with nothing going on, I spend up to 250 hours a year on one board. If you have a lot of M&A or other things going on, it can quickly increase. So you need to be uh, involved in something that you really will be passionate about and not consider it just a burden. Uh, most importantly is the culture of the company and the people that you will be associated with. Um, because you really are linking your reputation to this organization and the people that you're working with. And for me, it's, it's really important to, uh, to try to ascertain whether there's uh, a compatibility of values and a moral compass for decision making that is aligned with mine. Um, so I'll leave it open. You can ask questions about how one assesses that, but I think th that is really a critical aspect of thinking about uh, how and what boards do I get on. And I'd add to that, um, and I want to maybe pose a few questions to the panel, that uh, stating the obvious, uh, board members will never know as much about the company as management. So you are dependent on the integrity of management. Mm -hmm. You are dependent on being sure that management is open and transparent because yes. no one is going to ferret out issues when you're on a board. I mean, you might happen upon something, but it's highly unlikely, number one. Number two, when the inevitable challenge arises, which it always does, if you're on a board long enough, something happens. Do you want, do you want to be in the boat with these people? You know, mm -hmm. uh, Do you have confidence in the integrity and the balance and stability and the judgment of the people you're going to be relying on, as you said, for your rep, for the shareholders, for your reputation. You know, you're part of this now, right? So, I think those are very important criteria. And I'd also add, um, you should be, when you make a decision, you should be committing for the long term. Yes. This is this isn't sort of the flavor of the week, you know that. It sounds interesting now in a year or two years from now, something else comes along and you go, well, that was great, you know, I'm going on to something else. These are, these are long-term commitments and, and uh, we can talk about best practices on governance, wh whether there should be mandatory rotation and things like that, which I think is a, an important discussion. But you should be thinking, you know, nine, 10 years at least, right? right. And, and it's not smiled upon if you decide there's a greener pasture, right? You know, uh, to, and trade off. So, 
These are important, I agree, these are important decisions. Maybe keying off of that, though, from each one of you, mm -hmm. a little more about what's it like on a board? You know, what, what, it, what is the feeling? What is the cadence? What, what are the things that, what are some of the personal challenges you faced in terms of learning how to be a director? Um, <laughs> Um, sure. I think my, my perspective is probably unique among this because, you know, it's part, sort of part of my day job <laughs> to be a board member. So um, what it feels like to be um, an investor board member. So th there are some things that are simpler when you're an investor board member than, you know, what Sandy and Judy are describing, what, which is many times these companies are really small and you're, you're picking a company to be, you're going to be part of the journey for you know, seven, 10, 12 years. But when you first start out, most times the company is fairly small. You know, in my case, many of the boards I got on, I was usually, you know, among the first few board members in there. You know, company, the board sizes are pretty small. They're, you know, three to five members when they start. When a company goes public, they might have, you know, nine members or something like that. But you, you kind of start small, which makes it very, um, I guess clean, it's a, you know, a clean sheet of paper you're starting from. Um, in the early days, um, typically it's, you're working very closely with management you know, because you know, many times you start with two people and a dog at a, at a company and, <laughs> and, and, and you're part of the team. So you're, it's, it's, not, um, it, it's a very uh, collegial relationship. You know, it's not as much about governance per se because the, share, the capital structure is very simple. It's usually the, the founders and maybe a few friends and family and then one or two investors. So you're, it's not like you have a big shareholding structure to worry about. And um, the governance pieces are actually simpler. Many times you don't even start auditing the financials until one or two years into the company. Right? So you, you start off with things that are much more about the business. Right? So what is the founder's vision for where this is? What is the market opportunity? What else are you seeing? What's your pattern recognition? So you're really a, a part of the board, uh, the, the company team, very active in hiring. So when you're, um, you know, as a board member, you're representing the company, you're helping the management recruit. So these are all kind of company building things you're doing in the first few years um, of the company. And in the venture world, it's pretty standard to have board meetings once a month. And in, in many of my, with many of my uh, CEOs, I, sp you know, I speak to them every week, right? Because I kind of, you get to know them um, very, very well because it's a small team. As the companies get older, uh, you know, older or bigger and better, and you have usually initially other investor members joining the board, and sometimes one or two independents uh, joining the board. And there it's much more, it's now starting to, you know, try to put together some institutional knowledge and some, you know, you, you, you do have audits. The, uh, you know, the auditor will usually come in with the finance team has no separation of duties because there's only one finance person. So, and this is a risk for the board, better be aware. I mean, that's true for every, you know, startup growing up. And so you kind of start, uh, you know, dealing with some of these issues where you're now starting to do a little bit of governance but you're still much more focused on the strategy. I mean, where, where is the market? Are we focusing on growth or, you know, what's, what is the company strategy? That's the more important part. And then as the companies grow to be larger and getting ready to exit typically, then you have a, a much more focus on governance. You have committees being created. And so I've been part, I mean, you, you first get on the comp committee. So that's the, share, you know, as the, usually as the shareholder, you're, you know, you'll be on the comp committee. Um, and then you get an audit committee created um, down the line. You will have a governance committee created down the line. And, and the audit committee usually, by the time the companies are public for a few years, you need true independence on the audit committee. And so we start recruiting for people who are CFOs externally who might want to come in and take a board role and start expanding the team to include that so you have functioning separate committees. Um, and also internally start helping the management team build those institutions. So you say, okay, now you need to have a finance team. You need to have software de deployed. Um, you need to make sure that there are HR processes, um, things like that. So my experience has been much more kind of a following the growth path of these companies. And then you have some of these uh, companies in, you know, they have their own journeys happening in parallel and they're slightly uh, one behind the other. 
Um, but that has actually helped me really learn about kind of what, what the board member's role is in all of this and how do you interact with these other people. It, it's very much you're in the boat with these folks and sometimes you get crosswise because you know, people's incentives are different or their aspirations are different. Um, and then you have to really try, start to figure out, okay, you know, is, is this a time when everybody has to stay in the boat together? And typically this comes to a head around, you know, do we have the right team leading the, uh, the company? Is this the right team for this stage of the company? Um, so those are the types of um, problems that come in. But in my case, I feel like it's been a, um, an organic development where I've been able to follow the history of many of these companies as, as these questions come up. And um, so it's been a good way to learn about you know, what your responsibilities are on a board. Um, and I think this does translate well to what public company boards do, but in, when you go into a public company board setting, you typically join a board that already exists and there are people and personalities already there and you have to figure those out. Um, and you know, I have some experience with that when I do later stage investing, but um, you know, for the most part, the early stage investing makes it a nice way to, to join some of these boards and learn how to be part of that team. And in the spirit of the discussions today, a few words about are you the only woman on these boards, or what is it, how, do you, how are you effective as a woman on the board as well as representing the investors? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I think um, we know, you know, I work in Silicon Valley. I don't know if I mentioned that in my introduction. And we know that the venture world is not, it's not gender, gender equal right now. It's very you know, far from being gender, gender equal. So it does show up on a lot of these um, private company boards. Um, there, but there is actually a concerted effort in Silicon Valley um, and outside to have um, a diversity of life experiences and of course women and as well as what we are talking about here, right? Where you have people who come at it from different types of preparation and have those be represented on many, many boards. So on my boards, I've typically been a minority, but there have been a few other women um, that I've gotten to know uh, fairly well. Um, there are, on the nonprofit boards and so on that I'm on, there are lots of women. Um, and that's actually one of the things we did talk about, which is, um, how much does a nonprofit experience tra translate to uh, getting on public company boards? I haven't been a nonprofit board member for long enough to know, but that's actually one of the questions because I do see a big separation on how many women you see on private company or public company boards versus nonprofit boards. And Susanna, yeah. again, from the private company perspective, I'd be interested in what you'd like to add. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to actually go to the, Good. I was, uh, you know, it is sort of the Vogue thing right now. A lot of boards are saying, oh my gosh, we need a woman. <laughs> right? And so the chances that you might be interviewed as the woman um, are very high. <laughs> um, there's a lot of research, as I think most of the folks in the room are aware of, that if you add a woman, all of a sudden your results are going to get better. <laughs> and you do. And they do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, uh -huh. and in fact, um, things didn't go terribly south when I joined the board that I'm on. That they've actually added a second woman now. So excellent. Really awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I'll just say, prior to the current role I had, I did do. I interviewed with other boards, and I'll share one. Just be prepared. The questions. There's. They're not. Guide, you can be asked anything during a board interview. There are not. There's no HR law or anything like that that applies. Yeah. Um, and one one gem of an interview. Uh, one of the guys sat down with me and said, "Now, how will you feel about working with very wealthy men?" <laughs> I kid you not, that was the question I was asked. And I think to myself, okay, I work with Sundar Pichai, yeah. Larry Page, Sergey Brin. I think I'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it took everything for me not to say yes. something snide at that point in time. But you know, um, they will ask you about your kids and your family and your sexual orientation. I mean, they'll, they'll go anywhere. And they, they're really just trying to figure out, do you gel with me, right? Do you gel with a culture of the company and all those sorts of things. So, you know, in terms of like assimilating to the board that I'm on, I'm very lucky. Um, I love the board I'm on because I'm intimately involved with the company. I routinely meet, and because we're not guided by, you know, the regulations of a public company board, I routinely meet as kind of like the product advisor and the marketing advisor. 
the IT advisor. Like I have lots of subcommittee meetings with different parts of the company just to give them advice and the like. Um, and in, I've really enjoyed that. It's been a fabulous way just to sort of get outside my day job and really exercise the full muscles of sort of thinking about the, the system that is an enterprise. That's great. Yeah. Sandy, you want to take a shot at public company life? Sure, sure. <laughs> well, I think it's just a natural evolution from what you have described. And um, as you said, there are established committees that do a lot of the work. Uh, and then there's work that occurs in the boardroom. And um, if you think about the key responsibilities for a public company, uh, since Sarbanes-Oxley, there are some very well-specified responsibilities, particularly on the financial side, in terms of the reporting relationships for the audit committee. The, um, the external auditors actually report to the audit committee. Uh, the internal auditors report to the audit committee. You may have risk uh, officers that report to the audit committee. So there's sort of a routine that goes uh, along with the quarterly reporting where you have uh, usually a couple of hour meetings uh, before reporting the quarterly results, in addition to your uh, meeting in conjunction with the board meeting. There's a compensation committee because the board has responsibility for um, the compensation of the CEO and the top executives, but also um, for the overall selection, evaluation, deselection, if necessary, of the CEO, uh, and making sure that there are succession plans in place uh, for not only the CEO, but uh, the C-suite, and that the talent development is occurring. So a lot of the laboring work occurs in the compensation committee, but those activities do get brought back to uh, the boardroom for full discussion. And those um, board meetings and then uh, compensation, audit, nominating, governance committee meetings in conjunction with the board meetings typically occur four to five times a year. Uh, in the case of my board, there are two intense days, including evenings of work. Uh, and there are lots of uh, reviews of the uh, sort of the regulatory and um, administrative role of the, of the board. But what's most important is that the board is there to represent primarily the shareholders, but also the other stakeholders, in ensuring that there is long-term value created in, within this public company. And so uh, there is the process of reviewing and approving the strategy, uh, oversight of the execution of the strategy, and making sure the results are commensurate for that long-term value creation and the overall review of key risks and making sure that risks are managed in an appropriate way. So those are all the things that, that we work on in general. Of course, there are um, major capital appropriations. There are uh, M&A transactions. Fortunately, not good. Uh, my boards have not been attacked by activists, but um, that's certainly something that uh, the board gets involved in, not just the management when, when that happens. Um, and there can be all kinds of uh, upsetting events. Being on the board of a financial services company during the financial crisis uh, was quite an interesting process. Uh, we had phone conferences every week, and that went on for several months. Um, so there's the natural rhythm of the four to five uh, in-person meetings uh, a year, there's the things associated with quarterly reporting, typically by phone, and then there's all of the ad hoc activities. I would say just um, one of the things that's interesting is this relationship between management and the, and the board. And um, it's, it's really difficult, I think, sometimes for first-time board members to get that balance right. <clears throat> because the board really is there for oversight and approval and uh, making sure that everything is on course for value creation, but they're not there to manage the company. Um, and so uh, it's, I've, I've watched it certainly when I first came on a board, but also as I've seen uh, particularly CEOs go on to the board. You know, they're ready to go in there and you know, just fix things. Yeah. Um, 
but that's not the way it works. <laughs> and so, you know, getting the relationships right, getting the, the cadence, as, as Judy described it right, and uh, over time, being able to be not only collaborative in the board meeting, but um, in a position where management will call you on the side and seek your advice on things um, is really uh, an important evolution of a strong director on a public company board. Yeah, that, that's great. And I, I'd add, uh, I was thinking about the personal dimension too, uh, in addition to the structure. Uh, one thing that struck, struck me from the beginning is uh, whereas in, when you're in a company, uh, working in a company, there's a hierarchy. And, you know, if I go to a senior team meeting, obviously I want to talk about issues that pertain across, you know, to the business and HR or whatever, but I'm the CFO, right? So all eyes turn if it's a particular topic. When you're on a board, it's a new team, right? It, it, there is no hierarchy. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a one, it's a really important, challenging personal development experience mm -hmm. because you have to figure out how to be effective and contribute just the way you said, mm -hmm. you know, you're not management. Uh, understand the business, understand the talent, and build relationships with your fellow directors so that, you know, you become part of this new team. And, and with public company boards, as was noted, there's, there's a, a turnover and so sometimes there is a culture, if you will, that remains, mm -hmm. but there are different personalities and there are people at different parts of the learning curve. And uh, so it's a different dynamic. It's, 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 it it's, it's, it's really interesting to figure out how, you know, how to be effective. And someone actually uh, made a comment to me the other day that he's the chairman and CEO in the companies. And he said, you know, I've wa I sort of watch you. And he said, when you're chairing a committee, you're acting in one mode, and when you're around the board table, I see you listening, you know, and asking a question, but it's a different mode because it's a different role, you know, Absolutely. and it's, it's, a, it's a terrific learning experience. And if you, can forge, if you can forge really good relationships, then you really have an effective board because, again, when things are difficult, um, or even if you want to address important strategic issues or CEO su succession or even right. some compensation issues or lightning rods, you, you really need to have established the right kind of uh, trust and interaction and, um, and sort of form a new team. Uh, Absolutely. But there's no coach and there's no playbook. <laughs> so anyway, I think maybe if we've set, I mean, there's, there's so many more aspects, but I thought maybe if that's set the stage, uh, everyone's been asking such great questions, maybe we use some time to address our comments to areas that are on top of your mind. Oh boy, okay, good. <laughs> Glad we did that. <laughs> Thank you, um, I'm Diane Rucker. I have a question for you about the differences in joining advisory boards, nonprofit boards, and for-profit boards, because there's a very different dynamic in each of those. Are they, in your opinions, good starting points? to reach what we call the ultimate goal, the for-profit board? Or do you see the challenges along those as more bogging you down? Um, so my experience has been more the latter. <laughs> I'd be interested in your perspectives as well. Please. Want to go ahead? Suzanne? OK, I, I'll go ahead. Um, so <laughs> I um, actually served on a, a small board at MIT for a period of time when the Sloan Fellows had a board of governors. Um, that was a great experience. It did not involve explicit fundraising, so that was for me very good. Um, I think a lot of uh, the nonprofit boards come with distinct targets for fundraising, and that really works for some people. And for me, that was like the time investment to do that was was challenging. Um, uh, I also serve on uh, my undergraduate college in a business leadership council there, and I really enjoy that as well. So I think those two things were actually helpful in getting a for-profit board seat. Um, they did look for that experience. So I'd highly advise that you do something like that to get started. Um, but, you know, in terms of is it, is, I think it's going to totally depend on fit for what that role looks like versus your life and what you really want out of a board long term. Others? I th I've, I've been on a variety of nonprofit boards, and I'd say they're from the continuum of 
uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital that runs like a corporation, uh, down to very small uh, nonprofits where they really need a lot of your technical expertise and hands-on engagement. Um, so the work of the board can be quite different than what the work of the public company board is. So it, it depends on how, what the work is and how translatable that is. I would say there are two advantages to a nonprofit board moving you to a public board. One is the network. If you end up on nonprofit boards with individuals who are also in the for-profit world, then you can establish some relationships. People will see how you operate in the boardroom, and they can think of you for other opportunities. Um, and I think the other thing is just uh, the experience of working in this um, advisory role uh, in the nonprofit as opposed to being the one making the decisions and getting, getting comfortable with how uh, managing through influence through the board structure works uh, can be translated from the nonprofit to the public. I have a, sorry, I have a question over here. Oh. Um, taking your point that the board doesn't know as much as management, what happens when you're in a failing company situation? and you feel that management isn't making the right decisions, the board is unanimous in their view, but isn't ready to replace the CEO, how do you influence and affect change? I uh, just stepped down as a chair of a private company board that hasn't been successful, and it's been unbelievably difficult to try to direct change. So I would be really interested to hear how you do that when things are going poorly. Hmm. I, uh, <laughs> Motorola comes to mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, there, in the end, it was it was a two-pronged um, response. The CEO had to change, and we had an activist investor. Uh, and uh, those are real catalysts. Uh, at the end of the day, the CEO sort of the theme we have here, the, the CEO and management are responsible for the strategy and the execution of that strategy, not the board. And if that fails over too long a period of time, you, you have to make a change. Um, in this current environment, you then also get this extra catalyst where activist investors may play a role, maybe not in a private company, obviously, but in a, in a public company. But I, but I do think that's fundamental. I mean, you, you, I think there has to be, I think, it has to be balanced with patience, you know, uh, in terms of understanding the root cause of what's going on, as opposed to just automatically assuming, you know, the leader has to go because I don't think that's intelligent either. Uh, but uh, in those times, uh, and Sandy alluded to this earlier, there's a lot more time the board has to spend in really doing a deeper dive on what's going on, um, and. Ideally, also getting their information from more than one source. Yeah, I think um, from a from a private company setting, I think that's actually the the most. I mean, really, the the only decision the board makes is about hiring and you know firing the CEO, right? I think that's really the only real decision you make, and all your other activities are really to to build your own understanding of the business of the company, of the culture, in terms of making a good decision. Um, you know, so that's the only decision that's really independent of, of the, I guess, the, the non-executive board members in some ways. So, you, so when I was at Intel, we used to have this um, framework on, you know, whenever you have to make a decision, you have to think about the decision maker, the ratifiers, and the stakeholders. And then you really kind of have to have that situational awareness to say, in this context, am I the decision maker, or are we the decision maker, in this case, the board, which is, which is not what Intel thought about. But anyway, I think you know, we kind of adapted to saying the board can make a decision about this, but you have to be really, really well informed about what's going on in the company. And you'd be surprised at how much stuff goes on in small companies. I think you, know, you think you know, stuff goes on in big companies, but there's a ton of stuff that goes on in uh, small companies. Um, and so you kind of have to have, obviously, the, the lens of um, what the management is presenting to you at these board meetings and, and in the more formal settings. 
but you also have to be able to, uh, to collect sort of the 360 degree view of what's going on in the company without it being necessarily uh, you know, undercutting management because you, know, you do want to trust this CEO and the management you know, until you, you know, they have, you're invested in their success until you don't believe that they're the right person anymore. So it's a, it's a delicate dance to figure out how do, how do you stay informed, how do you not put your fingers into operational things, but at the same time have a perspective on what's happening at the company and with, whether this is the right direction or not. Um, and then it, it really comes into play uh, in terms of the overall strategy of a company. You know, startups are famous for pivots, right? So, um, you know, you, you, when do you decide you have to pivot? When do you decide that this is failing or this is not working? Um, and you know, you and you're usually doing this under the stress, a, a lot more stress of running out of money than you than you do in in you know many public company settings. Um, in, this, in the case of a startup, you know, you have people who have raised money and who are working towards milestones that are usually 18 months away. I mean, this is the cadence of raising money for these startups, and you have to put points on the board on, this is my strategy, and I have, you know, uh, th made this much progress, and I'm going to go raise another round of financing, or I'm hopefully getting profitable at some point. Um, and so you, you don't have that much time to actually react to new information and make sure that you're you know, you're really on the path that you all agreed you wanted to be or that the market is cooperating in mind, whatever you, you said you wanted to do. So I think it comes down to, um, you know, knowing enough about the company that you can form these decisions, being present and well-intentioned about saying, okay, we really want to get the best outcome possible for the shareholders. And as much as possible, trying to lean in to say, okay, the, we are working with the management team we have and we'll make them successful until we no longer um, uh, believe that's the case. So yeah, even, uh, even though we hear in the newspapers that you know, this person got fired and so on, the reason, the reason things seem to move faster in um, startups is people are not just you know, firing people randomly. It's really that the pace is much faster. If you're gonna run out of money in 18 months, you gotta have make these decisions much, much faster. But it does make for the same sort of things. You're weighing the same things. You're just doing them a little faster. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm Amy Salzhauer. I'm, I've been on for-profit boards and non-profit boards, and we've talked about those. I do want to encourage people who are looking for another stepping stone to boards that there are also government-appointed boards. So I was appointed by the governor of Maine, not LePage, Angus King, <laughs> um, to the Small Enterprise Growth Fund Board and to the investment committee for the Massachusetts Renewable Energy Investment Trust. And even though I'd been on boards before, I think I learned so much on those boards. They have, um, they have a lot more discipline than some nonprofit boards. They don't have a requirement for you to give money to be on the board. <laughs> and they also have uh, accountability to the taxpayers and oftentimes very experienced people. So if you're looking for a board seat that might be a stepping stone, those government appointed boards might be really interesting. But I have a question because our hackles, Allison and I were sitting here, and when the subject came up of people looking for women to be on boards, both of us got frustrated. <laughs> I have been approached multiple times by public companies that are looking for a woman on the board but not like you because you were experienced CFOs, but just because they're looking for to fill that diversity seat on the board. And it's infuriating. It's a huge amount of work. I don't have world enough in time to just be there <laughs> and do that work just so I can fill the diversity seat <laughs> on the board. On the other hand, I've heard very experienced women who've challenged me on that and said it's worth it just to have a woman on the board because we need to have more women on boards. So I'm wondering how you feel about that. <laughs> I'd, I'd offer one thing and it keys off of what Ellen mentioned in her, in her opening. Um, so, and as we were discussing, that we have to parse this a little bit. You have to be interested in the company and you have to have confidence in the management and it has to be something before you get to the women part that you would want to do, right? So that is essential. After that, I, I will say that um, I would vote in favor, okay? And what you see in the UK and what you see on con in continental Europe is basically a government um, request standard 
that will be enforced basically by sunshine, publishing statistics, of women being at least a third of the representation on the board for good reasons. All the reasons that we've talked about, okay? There are a lot of good reasons. So I, I don't, you know, we can discuss where the impetus is. Some of us are old enough to remember the, the enactment of the Equal Opportunity Act, okay? Before the, so, and I was graduating from Sloan right around that time. I can't tell you how many banks just wanted me because I was a woman, right? It, 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 I won't name the bank, but it was, would you like to work here? Would you like to work there? And you know, but if it, if, but if it hadn't been for EEO, a lot of us wouldn't be sitting in this room, right? And so you may not like the method, but the end result is probably worth it, right? So again, I, personally, I think, I think I, 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 none of us, so none of us like to be getting offers just because of our gender. Right? I mean, that is, in a way, insulting. Um, uh, but, you know, if it opens up a door and it helps transform the way governance is practiced in the United States, you know, we take the good with the bad. That would be my view. I, yeah, and I, I think your point about the, the first two threshold questions is, is absolutely essential. Uh, even if you get past, you know, being interested in the business, and you find that the culture and the people are such that um, you are just going to be shut out mm -hmm. when you're in the boardroom, then, you know, I, I don't think I would take on the cause just to be a woman in the boardroom. It, life's too short for that. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. So, so I was going to follow up on that comment. So Judy, you and Sandy both said that you're... Oh, sorry. Yeah, so you have to, do you have the other one? I can go on? The other one. Dominique Valentini, you mentioned that, um, uh, in fact, the, the board is dependent on the transparency on, and on the integrity of the management. And I was wondering if you had uh, been uh, in a situation where there was no transparency. And I was wondering how you, you, uh, you dealt with it. And, and even, because I had a case a little bit like that, how you, could, you would deal with it when you are the only woman on the board and you, it seems that you are joining a, an old boys club and nobody was really caring about transparency before. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so let me make sure I understand the question correctly. I, I think you were saying that you're on the board, you're a woman, but you're not really being engaged effectively in the board process, is that right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the the idea is let, let's say there's a problem, uh -huh. right? and there's no confidence that there's transparency and understand what's going on. Okay. But the majority of the board is are part of the old boys network, and they uh, don't really care. Got it. You're the woman on the board. Now what? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. A tough <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I think as has been alluded to earlier today, um, sort of starting with fact base and asking probing questions and trying to get a common uh, set of facts in front of the board for decision making and not letting those people who want to just sort of sweep it under the rug, sweep it under the rug. And to try to engage the group in a conversation about the problem as opposed to sort of getting into, uh, you know, the personality aspect of it. I think that would be sort of the first course of action. Um, I think another thing that I would do um, is to have some private conversations with people about what's going on, 
because sometimes people are reluctant within the group uh, to declare themselves as being maybe uh, upset with what the CEO is doing or talking about the problem per se, uh, and seeing if there's some common uh, ground and you can get some support in the boardroom. Uh, ultimately, you know, if there is a major problem and it's not being dealt with, I think you as a board member need to think about whether you want to continue to be part of that. Yeah, I guess one, one additional suggestion would be to try and see if you can actually build, build the board a little bit better. So some of it would be to, you know, sometimes the, your co-board members may be used to a certain way of working and, you know, they may or may not need to be insular and they are, right? And you kind of have to sort of work through that and see if you can improve it. Usually adding new people actually changes the dynamic of the, the whole group. So, um, you know, I heard um, actually a, a public company woman CEO who was speaking and she, when she uh, uh, took the CEO role, her entire board, um, she had, I think, seven men and, um, I mean, all seven were men and then I think uh, five of them had been there for a really long time. So, and, you know, they were not going to uh, be termed out and so on. So her first action was to actually increase the board size. She, she didn't try to replace the, you know, anybody there. She essentially said, okay, I'm going to add a, a few more people. So she brought on two women board members um, and expanded the board to nine, which was easier to get done than trying to replace um, uh, you know, someone. And then slowly she kind of started to work with introducing term limits or in introducing sort of a retirement age. Um, so she started kind of nibbling around things that would not be as in your face and, you know, so it, it, trying to uh, change an existing body where nobody is really, the status quo works for a lot of people. Um, that is, you know, it can take a lot of time and, you know, if you don't have time, they might wear you down, right? So you, so you kind of have to figure out you know, if this is important enough for you to, to fix and if you do, then you kind of start out nibbling around the edges and then, then starting to address the whole problem. I just amplify that that sort of that the one on one relationships with each of the board members. I mean, tiny things like on in the elevators or sharing a ride to the airport or you know taxi after yes. dinner or something like that. Those are great ways to sort of you know calibrate on where each person is, and they become very important. You learn about the elevator pitch, you know, in <laughs> business school. Well, it's like that the tiny conversation can really help you sort of do and in, you know influence things uh, when things get tough. Oh, wait. Um, my oh, name wait, is Barbara wait. I'm Russell. Sorry. Did you? Sorry. Did you get the mic? No, not yet. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. Shall I go first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Barbara Russell. I think it's a great panel, by the way. Thank you. Um, my issue really is on um, liability um, and maybe reputation. Um, back in 2008, I was a member of a um, an association of board members here, founded by a Sloan woman, Leslie Rawl, called Broads on Boards. <laughs> <laughs> Another self-deprecatory name. Um, and <clears throat> during that meeting, I was on, a, on private boards. Most of the women were on public boards. And one of the women woman was uh, on AA, AIG's board, and another was on J.P. Morgan's board. And it was during the height of the financial crisis, lots of tumult. Um, they were very concerned, even though they had DNO insurance, about what the consequences were, especially on the AIG board. And I've not been on a public board, but I was wondering what your views were in terms of um, liability, not only to reputation, but legal liability. Um, it's a serious issue. Uh, you, you shouldn't join a public company board if you don't feel you can navigate uh, those kinds of pressures. I, I think that you need to divide it up into different categories. Uh, there's the reputational issue. There's the anxiety. There's just, there are the depositions. There are all kinds of things you go through that are very trying versus financial exposure because basically, I guess we could genericize it, but the prudent man rule um, is what obtains. And so if you have been using your best business judgment, you've been, you've been acting in a prudent way, and you are on the board, and the role of a board member is clearly defined versus the role of management, um, it's highly unusual that in the end 
you get exposed to any financial um, penalties, but it's a very unpleasant. It's a it's a it's a very unpleasant time to go through. Um, and uh, I I spent I I was on boards on broads on boards. I went to I think one meeting. Leslie was also on I think Fannie Mae or something. So uh, th those are really difficult times. Um, and uh, I don't minimize that. And uh, there'll be a lot of stress, and there'll be a lot of work, and they'll, and I think everyone came out all right. I even think in AIG, I think the board was finally okay. exonerated in that. But um, as opposed to, let's say, Enron, which is a different story. <laughs> yeah, I think where uh, where there's been um, either the threat or the reality of uh, financial liability has been where board members really did not carry out their duties and um, you know that and oftentimes that's in the audit committee that um, you know they they either haven't asked the right questions or they haven't pursued issues um, that they should have pursued um, but that's that's a rare thing I think the, the prudent man has been so far at least um, a pretty good protection for public board members you have the mic <laughs> yeah, it's not such a good segue from a um, bad comment, but um, I think there's many of us in the room that are interested in being on public company boards. I'm an entrepreneurial CEO and I've been on private boards, but um, would just be interested, I mean, Judy, you and Sandra both said that you just got calls from headhunters, right? And because you're CFOs, you were CFOs of high profile, you know, Fortune 100 companies. So those of us that aren't in that position, what's some practical advice as to how to position yourself to be on a public company board? Go ahead, well, because I, I think Sandy you said I had a couple yeah. of ideas. Um, and one is uh, it's easier maybe to make the transition as a private company goes public. And so uh, maybe thinking about are there some private companies that would be a good fit for you, that you have some network access to, and that you think are likely to go public. And so you sort of manage your path that way. Um, I think the other way is to simply think about the things that you can bring to the party uh, on a public company board and to network with people who are in a position to influence uh, who's on the slate and who ultimately gets chosen for public company uh, positions um, and to make sure they understand what those things are. I think one of the difficulties is that um, it's highly valued on a public company board to have had the public company experience because you understand um, all of the pressures and the issues around the public investor base and uh, the regulations that are associated with a public company that aren't with a private. Um, and so oftentimes what boards are looking for are people from the C-suite of a public company who already know all that stuff. Um, so I think positioning yourself maybe from an industry standpoint or a technology standpoint and letting your network know your availability and interest is one alternative. And the other is maybe this path through uh, an IPO for a private company. But you probably have some other suggestions. Well, I was th thinking as you were speaking that not knowing your area of expertise, but the the pro the capabilities that boards are looking for has evolved as technology has evolved. Mm -hmm. That's true. So the classic profiles are still fair and true, but they're. Boards are looking for a lot different kinds of capabilities now with digital, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there you're not, you know, the, the competition for those people is fierce. So uh, I think there is more of an openness mm -hmm. to entertain candidates who may not have been in the C-suite or may not have public company experience if they've got, you know, Motley Fool experience, mm -hmm. right? That that translates to some of the competencies that, that that they're looking for for that insight and challenge on the board. So I would just add that. 
And I'd also add that there's um, a number of services emerging now, like the board list. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, uh, the board list requires a C-suite, public company C-suite endorsement, um, but it's a, it is a, it's all for women, um, and it's a number of companies sourcing from the board list. And there's a number of other services too, like Equilar. And the, 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 there's, I'd encourage you know, plant a thousand seeds, <laughs> honestly, yeah. um, and um, and and leverage the technology, leverage LinkedIn and other things for for opportunities. I think we can take one more, one more right. qu last question. Um, so to kind of turn the tables a little bit. Um, and ask for your experience as board members. Maybe you could share some best practices from management's point of view of providing information to board members and really leveraging the expertise of board members to help make the business better. So I'll give you my favorite, all right? Um, uh, GSK has a practice of providing the calendar of all of the major management meetings for the company for the coming year so that non-executive directors can attend anyone they want. That means research meetings, the risk oversight committee, the finance leadership team, the US business, the emerging markets business. I could go on and on and on. It's a long <laughs> list. And they genuinely mean it. They want you to sign up ahead. You know, I mean, don't just drop in. They do not alter what they do because you're there. Uh, and I have found it to be absolutely the best practice for a variety of reasons. We touched on earlier that the board is responsible for CEO succession. My issue with that is most boards and most board practices don't get a chance to really know management mm -hmm. because they get a show and tell. You may sit next to them at dinner and learn what they did on their summer vacation. That, that, that doesn't tell you how they, how they work with their team, their judgment, you know, how they operate as a leader, et cetera. Going to these meetings, you sit there, you see it. Uh, you know, so you get a deeper appreciation of what's going on. You also, management is signaling, to your point about transparency, management is signaling there are no secrets here. You can walk in any place you want. You can see what's going on. Um, so it builds trust in, 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 a, in an enormous way. Um, and then, oh, by the way, you learn more about the business and the people. You know? So I, I just think that's best practice. And I will tell you that I have had limited success transplanting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, a couple of other things. So I think um, one of, you know, um, one of my companies, um, about a, a you know, few years in, they started uh, actually redoing how they do the board meeting. So there's one section which is like almost a blitz round of all the um, operational items. Okay, this is, you know, this is finance reporting. So, you know, so normally a board meeting, you, know, you have uh, the CEO will do the overview highlights, low lights, and then you do the, you know, each, each team, finance team comes in, marketing team comes in, and so on. You, and for the most part, you run out of time at the end of uh, all of these report outs to actually have a substantive discussion. And that's one of the issues because you, you know, people are really over scheduled on these boards. So from a management perspective, if you want the board to be useful and not just be like a reporting um, authority, so you kind of have to manage that process. So um, this company, they basically turned it around and said, okay, I'm, we're gonna put all of the operational updates, we'll give you the slides beforehand and we'll have a lightning round in the beginning. And then the, the CEO and usually a few of the exec team would come in with a topic of interest, like what is the main thing happening to this company that you need to know about and we need your opinion on? And that was also published. And you know you would you you would come in prepared, and they you know they expected the board to actually help, right? And so I would say, um, uh, kind of managing the board board members who usually do want to help, and um, they're typically busy or they're distracted by many other things. Um, you kind of have to manage that process a little bit more. So thinking through and making it longer actually usually does not help. Right. Um, you just have people who you know just do other things right, in in the board meeting, and um, so you kind of without without uh, you know um, eliminating the constraint. How do you re restructure the time with the board members? That's usually a, a good place to start for management. Okay. Thank you all.
Thank you.